Welcome to Uncaged, the show that celebrates thought leadership from today's top business leaders. The program provides a voice to amazing executives from around the globe who are shaping the world of business today and mapping the path to the commerce of tomorrow. Today, we're speaking with Tim Murphy. Hey, Tim, how are you? Hey, it's good to be here. It's great to have you here, and we're going to be talking about a subject that is on everybody's mind. Tim is the director at Tenzing Consulting. He is a guru on supply chain management and operations. Tenzing is a non-traditional consulting firm, which brings together a worldwide network of experts in the field of procurement, supply chain, and operations. And so we'll be digging into that topic that is pressing for a lot of executives around the world right now. But before we get there, Tim, tell us a little bit about yourself and your career. Thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for the introduction. I'm flattered and Great I will try you. to live up to it. <laughs> so my career, I, I like to tell people that uh, I've never worked on a day in my life. I've been a consultant for my whole career. So 25 years ago, I joined a firm called Mitchell Madison right out of undergraduate and uh, have worked in a number of different firms, both large and small. So I worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers. I worked for boutique firms in San Francisco and New York. Um, and most of what I've done is in the supply chain and procurement space. I've helped companies save a lot of money. I've helped companies streamline, reduce risks. Uh, we help companies really align their supply chains with their corporate strategies. So how does the supply chain, instead of becoming an administrative function, instead of becoming something you have to deal with, how do you make your supply chain an enabler of your larger business goals? And then I've done some operational work kind of around that. So, you know, when you look at improving a supply chain, part of that might come down to how do you optimize a warehouse operation? Right. Or how do you get more productivity out of some of your workers, uh, your team that touch your supply chain or, or enable your supply chain? So th that's in a nutshell what I do and, and what I've been doing. Um, yeah, and it sounds to me like that is very much what you're focused on right now at Tenzing. And what a time to be working on the topics of operational management and supply chain management. Tell me a little bit about what's going on at Tenzing. It is a strange time to be alive. So <laughs> it's, you know, you're, you, uh, I, I, this is one of the strangest times. So I've been doing this for 25 years, and this is definitely one of the strangest times to be in supply chain and one of the most exciting times to be in yeah. supply chain in my career. So at Tenzing, we're a boutique firm. We are very specialized in supply chain and operations. And we're built on experts. So that's one of the ways, that's how we get to our impact. So instead of coming in with a bunch of generalists who are going to figure out your problem, we would tend to bring in an expert who understands the problem and is just trying to fit a solution to your organization. So okay. the, an example I would give is I was on a project last year and, and we had to bring in someone who was an expert in maintenance, repair, and operation supplies. So these are all the pieces and parts you need to keep a plant running. Mm. And this guy had 40 years of experience in MRO supply. His first job, similar to my first job out of college, was working in consulting. His first job was to work for an MRO manufacturer. Okay. He went on to sell MRO and become an executive in MRO Salesforce. He went on to manage a, a huge MRO portfolio as a, as a corporate buyer. I think it was like $600 million a year. And then he went on to be an MRO consultant. So this guy, I, I would say this guy knew more about maintenance, repair, and operations supply than I know about anything. Right. And what he was able to do and what we are able to do with experts is cut through a lot of the learning curve that you typically see from a consulting firm when they hit the ground. So you, you cut through that learning curve because we understand the industry. Right. This gentleman understood MRO better than anyone else in the company. Yeah, <laughs> basically to... able to write, kind of marry that strategic perspective with the practicalities of the real market or the real 
I'd say the battlefield. I think it that's is. the magic, right? Yeah, absolutely. And it's just, it's a matter of how do you, as you said, marry that knowledge to the current situation. And you say, okay, so this is based on your geography, based on what kinds of supplies you're buying, based on what kind of plants you're running. This is how you need to set this up. Yeah. These are the types of people you need to work with. Not just because they're going to give you the best prices, you're going to get good prices, but they're going to give you the best interface, the best service where they meet your plants, where they meet your need. And that comes down to a lot of supply chain. When you say supply chain manager, you say procurement, what triggers, and especially in a lot of executives heads is dollars. How do I squeeze my dollars? And absolutely, you want to get a market of competitive price. You want to get to a place where you're feeding your profits out of your supply mm -hmm. chain. But the flip side of that is there's so many other things you should get out of your supply chain that will help you become a more profitable organization. Well, I would imagine right now we're in a world where people would just be happy with a supply chain that actually is fully functioning and working at the normal speed of things sometimes. I find the conversation around supply chain fascinating. I remember in the early days of the pandemic, I had some conversations with supply chain experts and they were talking very focused conversations around this idea that we needed to create a supply chain that essentially, if international markets closed down, we could actually replicate things locally and kind of have no points of weakness in the whole structure. That conversation kind of has fallen by the wayside to a how the hell are we going to survive? You know, you know, what are we doing? You know, and I think everyone yeah. from customers all the way through to business owners, to people who actually are key parts of the supply chain have lived through a really interesting moment. Tell me more about what you're seeing out there, Tim. That, that conversation has been kicking around now for 10 or 15 years, right? Yeah. About well, we shouldn't be so dependent on foreign sources of supply. We shouldn't have, um, you know, we're exposed to these geopolitical risks. We're exposed. And it never has gotten a ton of traction. Even right. if you look at the U.S. government, the U.S. government is exposed to huge geopolitical risks in Absolutely. their supply chain. Well, we're living US it right now. Military, oh, I would say probably the oil situation is a good example. <laughs> Absolutely. It yeah. is. I had a conversation with some gentlemen a few months ago about the US military supply chain and how dependent they are on foreign sources for gunpowder. Think about that for just a second. Yeah. From a geopolitical standpoint, the risk of being had exposed on your access to munitions for the US government. And you so people have been talking about this and talking about this, but for so long, the, the supply chains, there's been so much financial advantage to the supply chain in Asia, in uh, you know, Eastern Europe, in India, in all these places. The, the financial advantage has just been so great that you haven't gotten much traction on that. Yeah. And then freight happened. Right. The freight crisis happened, right? So just, you know, if you think about this, uh, you know, your average freight container in 2019 globally, so this isn't even from China, this is just globally, was about $1,200, right? And it, it jumped up to like $4,200, $4,500 in 2020, 2021. Oh. And it's currently jumped up to like $8,000, $8,400, something like that, right? Wow. So you're seeing this drastic rise in the cost of freight. Now, at the same time, you look at a company like Maersk is went from gross profits in the mid single digits, so four, five, six percent, and now they're reporting gross profits in the forties. Wow! And that part of the way probably would have been there, a good investment to make. <laughs> absolutely right. I wish I had that kind of forethought. Yeah, but, <laughs> that's why I'm a consultant and not an investor. Yeah, but so you look at that, and then you start raising that even more when you get the surcharges and you get 
premium charges. So you have to pay premiums when you're shipping ocean freight if you're going to make sure you get a certain sale date and you don't get left at port. And you're going to get unloaded first. So now you're up like fifteen, twenty thousand dollars a container, and now it doesn't matter what it costs to produce it in Asia. If you have right. to pay twenty thousand dollars per container to get it here, the entire cost analysis is changing, changing yeah. dramatically. And now, when you think about inventory turns and you think about working capital. And how much working capital is tied up on the ocean outside of the port of Long Beach right now, right? Yeah. It's, it's insane because, you know, your average time to in transit has jumped from like 40 days from, you know, from like dock to dock up to into like the 80s. Wow. So you're having a, now what you're starting to hear a lot of people talk about is that nearshoring and reshoring both because of the geopolitical risk, which has also increased, um, you know, China is becoming a, a more and more interesting place to do business. Uh, and obviously, Eastern Europe right now is a really interesting place to do business. But now you're talking about actual costs, both in terms of landed. So you think about total cost of ownership on mm -hmm. an item that comes into your possession, right? Or the, or I guess, and the working capital cost that you have to invest in order to keep your factory running. And Are you really seeing see companies make the investments to build out factories, nearshore factories now? I guess in some ways, you know, yes, we have a short term acute need, but this really would, to make it work for a, let's say, a Fortune 2000 business. This needs to be part of a longer term strategy because obviously building a factory or tooling out a factory is no small task. You're right? absolutely right. So I'll, I'll say I'll answer that two ways. One, these things move in cycles, okay. right? So you have these massive capital investments in cycles for organizations. You always are having to refit, rebuild, redesign plants. Um, so if you're in, if you're a company that's in a cycle now, Committing to Asia becomes incredibly risky. And you mm. start looking at the free zone in Mexico, you start looking at the Dominican Republic, you start looking at so even certain states in the US, right? Yeah. Um, so if you're in that cycle, and the second way I'm going to answer that is we typically think about production, especially for large corporations, as I have a factory. But the reality is that a lot of that production is contract manufacturing production. Right. So I have a contract with someone to produce this. When my contract is up, I can recontract with someone who's closer to me. Let's say I was trying to do something locally. I guess in some ways I would try to be modeling out saying, okay, right now I might get huge orders, but two years from now, three years from now, the competitive pressures will be back and my market share most likely will shrink again right? But are enough companies changing their strategy so that they'll keep enough business flowing to me, right? It'll be worth my while. And you're seeing that? You're seeing companies well, make that? Um, I, I kind of earlier this year, I had a client electronics manufacturer um, who changed the contract manufacturing site for some of their uh, sub-assemblies mm -hmm. from Shanghai to the Dominican Republic. Wow. And you have, you know, when you look at that, you, you know, they signed a contract. So they're going to be within that site at a specific, you know, price with some inflation adjustment, which they're probably doing well on that inflation adjustment now because the numbers were less than they are yeah. in real life. But so How they, interesting. You know, wow. So they, mean, that's you know, and they're going to be locked in there for years. Wow, that's that was great for the Dominican Republic. Uh, you know, that's DR you know, is a good place for electronics manufacturing. You have a reasonable baseline of education, and you have a number of large contract manufacturing sites down there. Wow, I had no idea. That's really interesting. Well, let me change gears a little bit, Tim, and talk a bit more in a focused manner about the pandemic and the things that you guys experienced at Tenzing, how you operated as a business, and maybe some of the opportunities that have sprung from this moment.
It's funny. Let me talk to you a little about operations because let me talk internal and then we can look external. Internally, we, you know, for, a, a, you know, as a consultant, you're traveling all the time, right? So, you know, we're on the road 30 weeks a year, 40 weeks a year, something in that neighborhood. I think the my, most I was ever on the road was like 48 weeks of a year or something, right? Wow. <laughs> that was when I was a lot younger and recovered a lot better. But so when you, we hit all of a sudden, like 2020 happened and we stopped traveling, but we were still working. So yeah. we were working over the phone. We were working on video call, like the, the you know, the rise of Microsoft Teams, right? Yeah. And, and all of these, you know, we started working remotely. And I think as we've started to travel again, our clients have changed. Our clients have realized, I don't need my consultant on the ground every day. They're actually productive when they're not here with us. Right. So we've had, but it's incredible. It's expensive to bring them in every week. So we've yeah. had some clients, you know, so it's a combination of clients started looking at risk differently and they looked at that cost differently. So from the cost side, we've had clients say, okay, we're going to bring you in every other week, or we're going to bring you in once a month, but we're going to work with you full time. And, and we're just going to come in. And I think that was a combination of the cost that I, if I have to be honest, it was also the clients have started working from home more. Yeah. So I had a conversation with a client and I said, there was no place know, for you to go. I mean, right. Well, yeah. it was, I had a client with a client and I said, we'll come in as much as you want. I'll be there every week if you want me to. And the guy kind of paused. For, it was a call. It was a video call. I kind of paused for a second and said, if you're here every week, I have to be here every week. So let's do this every other week. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I think that that's a really interesting insight. And I, I'm excited to kind of see how it changes the way perhaps consulting functions. I think it actually, strangely enough, could have a positive effect because, you know, when you're together, it makes it more meaningful. And then the reality is that in some ways as a consultant, you know, you can play a mentor role in a digital fashion in a very positive way. So I'll be excited to see how that evolves. It, it, you bring up a good point because, you know, when we would be there all the time, it was just, you're just there, right? So yeah. you would, we, I'd be sitting in a cubicle working away and I might, you know, talk to a couple people that day, but in general, I'm just sitting in a cubicle working away, right? Yeah. And what we found is you can have almost or just as productive conversations over video. Right. And you could do a lot of that, you know, coaching, knowledge sharing you know, a little bit of mentoring as you go. But what we found is when we came on site, it's a very intensive, almost like workshop atmosphere. Yeah. Like we would spend two days or three days together and the client would block off those days and we would work through for, you know, eight hours a day and just kind of churn on stuff. And it so that became very, very productive. So what it, it was interesting, it was almost like, um, an agile sprint or something, right? Yeah. Where it was like you worked for a few weeks and then you had this really intense working session with the client. So Tim, I mean, here we are in a year that has certainly not been in any way like I thought it was going to be. <laughs> I was joking that my abilities as a Nostradamus have failed completely. You know, I really thought this was going to be it's a happy growth year. But it's presented a whole nother set of challenges. What are you guys seeing for the back half of the year? So you have a, a lot of really ugly forces. I mean, you have inflation, you still have supply chain issues. One of the biggest things we're starting to see and we're starting to talk about um, is scarcity. Mm -hmm. What you're seeing is, you know, for you think back 20 years, 20, 25 years, the whole time I've been doing this, maybe a little longer, the scarcity wasn't really an issue. Like maybe you couldn't always get exactly what you wanted, but you mm -hmm. could get what you needed. Right. Right. And now all of a sudden, you know, the, that paradigm is shifting. So we, we actually did, you know, as, as you, as you, as you do this, we did some research interviews with some suppliers mm -hmm. because 
to set the stage, you know, when you look at this and you, and you start thinking about supply chain as more than just some place to squeeze for dollars, you start thinking about strategic. So do you, you know, and you start thinking about it in terms of, I can't have my plant go down. Right. So I need my raw materials. I need services to keep the plant up. I need to have, you know, repair materials. I, I, you know, I can't have my fleet go down. Right. Like I need fleet in order to get things because that engine that fuels the company, that sales will stop if my plant goes down, if my fleet goes down, if, you know, on and on and on it goes. So if you stop thinking about this as an administrative function and someplace to find money and start thinking about it as your strategic enabler yeah. and you shift your paradigm from thinking about a paradigm of plenty to a paradigm of scarcity, all of a sudden, you, know, you had a lot of people start thinking, talking about strategic suppliers. This for me is a strategic supplier. I'm going to you know, prioritize them and treat them a certain way, right? Mm. And what we've been talking about for years, and, and it didn't really sink in, similar to the, you know, we need to reshore, didn't really sink in until it had to. We started talking about strategic partnerships. Mm. Because the reality is that you can't make a strategic partnership. You can declare a strategic supplier, but a strategic partnership is a two-way selection. Right. So we've em embarked on a research project and we've started interviewing a lot of suppliers across different industries and asking them what makes a strategic client and what does it mean to be a strategic client and what do they want? So, and I think that is going to be the shift, one of the big shifts, especially as this year, it's the real, this year, you're right, it's more of a reality is sinking in that we're not just going to snap back to 2019 at yeah. some point. Like this is a new reality we're going to have to deal with and whatever it evolves into will be something new and it won't just be 2019 again. Yeah, I love the framework that you just laid out, Tim. I mean, certainly dealing with scarcity is one issue, but this idea of looking at vendor and procurement relationships less on a contractual purchase basis and more on a how do we maintain this ecosystem in a way that is copacetic for all sides is great. I mean, that's spectacular. It's a funny one. You know, I've spoken to some of our larger Fortune 500 customers who, who have tons and tons of partners, they say, but how they're working with them is going through a massive shift. And as I can imagine, you know, if you're a small, let's say, strategic provider of a solution, you're looking for some type of a guarantee, right? That this is going to be a relationship that will be around for more than a year, right? Honestly, no. That no? wasn't what the... No, no. Wow. So it was very interesting. So let me say first, we asked, so we asked a bunch of these people, you know, what does it mean to be strategic? How, what happened to your strategic customers? during 2020, 2021. And the answer we often got back was they got everything they needed. So they had they experienced no outage, no supply outage, right? right? And it was great. Okay, great. How many of your customers are strategic? And the answer almost always came back less than 1%. <laughs> what happened to the rest of them? We did, and over and over again, what we heard was some version of we did the best we could. That is not encouraging. So that brings you around to, okay, how do I get into the 1%? Yeah. Wow. So that's a really interesting. What we started asking what they wanted were some combination of things. Almost all of them, one of the first things they said is pay on time. And look, from the corporate perspective, the attitude around that is usually, oh, well, you know, they know we're going to pay. They know we're good for it. They, you know, if we pay in 60 days or 65 days, whatever. That's not their attitude. Their attitude is pay me on time. Now, after that, you start to get some different answers, right? But it was things like, we want to be treated fairly. We want to be in, plugged into, like we want to be part of your organization. So mm -hmm. we don't want a your purchasing person to our salesperson connection. Well, we, we want that, plus we want a top to top. Right. We want you baked in, basically. And we want yeah. our operations group to, to work with your operations group. And we want a design group to work with your design group. And we yeah. want all these kinds of things. And the reality was 
it came down to, we want to feel that connection. We want to, you know, we want to be a part of your, and I had a supplier put this really brilliantly, a supplier executive said, we want to be family and we want you to be part of our family. I love and, it. And, you know, so there was also this, this theme that came out around uh, benefit. So we're not looking our, so as a supplier executive would look at that and say, the partner we're looking for isn't someone who's merely interested in themselves. Mm -hmm. They're interested in creating and sharing mutual benefit. And then when we ask them, well, what about competition? And they were all incredibly realistic about it. Right. Competition happens. We yeah. expect competition. We've come to live in a world where competition is normal. Right. What we want is fair and transparent competition. Right. And we feel like we can win. And, I, and I, so that to me was, was also very eye-opening because the perception in the corporate world often is, well, all the suppliers want is to not be competed so that they can screw me. And that's not <laughs> what they want. <laughs> You're making me think of a ton of topics that we've been loosely involved in for years. It does seem to me that one of the things that must be changing is the skill sets needed to be an effective procurement person at a company. I mean, it is. right. I mean, you're basically asking now for a completely different mindset. You know, I think most procurement companies have been famously pushing to longer accounts payable structures. I don't want to name any big, big companies, but you know, if I've seen that shift from 30 days to 60 days to 90 days to 120 from a, a lot of big companies and how they pay. And that has really, really hurt suppliers. I mean, more than anybody wants to admit it's just like getting kicked in the teeth right yeah. and how many of those companies that are making that push have hundreds of millions of dollars worth of cash on their balance sheet oh absolutely sitting in overseas accounts right so the <laughs> supplier looks at that and says i looked at your financial statement you've got 800 million dollars worth of cash and you're trying to squeeze me yeah. for 120 days on 10 million dollars yeah. yeah that's not family right that's right. not fair, right? And that's not mutual benefit. Yeah. Well, listen, Tim, it's been amazing talking to you about this stuff. I think that you're going to be at the eye of the storm for the foreseeable future, for sure, with so. these topics. If someone wanted to learn more about what you're working on in the supply chain and operations areas at Tenzing, where should they find you? So you can find us at uh, tenzingconsulting.com. And you'll start seeing, uh, you can find some of our research there. We're also publishing it out. So keep an eye out for us. And you can find me, uh, Tim Murphy, Tenzing Consulting at LinkedIn. Excellent. Well, Tim, thanks so much for being on Uncage today. We've been speaking with Tim Murphy, who's a director at Tenzing Consulting, which is a non-traditional consulting firm bringing together a worldwide network of experts in the fields of procurement, supply chain and operations. It's the time that every company is thinking about this and the topic that is on everybody's mind. Tim, thank you so much for the time and we look forward to having you back. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. Cheers.